Welcome to the Torpreneur Podcast. Travel industry veteran Shane Whaley will take you on a journey with fellow torpreneurs, sharing their tips, ideas, insights, and success stories to inspire you to make your tour business the best it can be. And now, here is your host, Shane Whaley. Hello and welcome to episode 156 of Tourpreneur. This is the podcast where we flatten the learning curve for tour operators and travel professionals around the world. Today, I am taking you on a trip to London. We're going to chat with the London storyteller whose real name is Tom Barkley Matchett. The London storyteller shares the stories of the people, places and personalities of what Tom calls the finest city on earth, London, of course. And we really dig into his tour business, how he got started, how he's creating his tours. It's, it's really a candid insight into the creative side of engaging visitors and guests through storytelling. And Tom discusses how he's been able to build a business and offer very different kind of tours, everything from a 007 tour to Winston Churchill, even a tour where you can have a full English breakfast with the London storyteller himself. Tom shares with us three major learnings, and that's what I'm working on now with Tourpreneur. I've spoken to many of you about what you want to hear on the show, and you really want to get those nuggets. Yes, you you love the stories of how we get started and sharing some of our struggles, but what are three key learnings, topics that the guests can share with us today? So we've got those and more. Um, Tom actually started off, it's very flattering, sharing with us why he enjoys the Torpreneur podcast, and we kick on into his major learnings from there. So thanks for tuning in, torpreneur.com forward slash 156. That's why I first tuned in. I, I, I mean, I think going back maybe 18 months or a couple of, you know, a couple of years ago, because it was before the pandemic. Yeah. But it was one of those things I thought, oh my God, you know, there's like other people doing this. Like not just being not just being guides, but like doing this, yeah. Like where it takes over your life or becomes your sort of your thing. And I thought, what a cool idea that you're getting. There was a guy in Washington that you had on. That's right. Um, Rob. He was talking about how yeah he'd started these tours as a as a side hustle, and then they'd sort of you know they'd built up. And I thought you know it was slightly different to my approach, but I thought aha, you know there I can see that there's lots of people who kind of in a similar position and then you know there there are a lot of them are facing the same challenges and the same hiccups as we all do whether it's with guests or um or, or technical technical platforms or whatever so absolutely anyway. no 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 that's good to hear and i'm going to keep that in the interview because that's the essence of what we do at tourpreneur this is not you know a travel show or oh, go to london see these 10 sites this is for People around the world that either want to start their own tour business or they're in the middle of running it and their spouse doesn't understand what it's like to run it. I mean, many of our spouses are great, don't get me wrong, but what we do is very different. There's no, there are very few networks and associations, especially if you're not in a big city. I imagine in London, there are tour guide associations. I know there's one in New York, but for many of our tourpreneurs, they're kind of on their own. And that's what we try and do on the show. And during the last couple of months, I've been asking our listeners, you know, okay, we're 150 episodes into this thing, you know, please give me your honest feedback, what do you want to hear more of, less of, just as we would on our tours, right, trying to get feedback from, from our guests. And, you know, we're really going to focus now on these three major key learnings, we are going to talk a little bit about how you got started, because everyone loves the Genesis story, and myself included in that, because we're all the one thing I've learned doing tourpreneurs, we're all such a mixed bunch of folks doing this. So Tom, LondonStoryTeller.com. How did this all get started for you? Pretty much by accident. It was one of those things I'd wanted to do for years. But there's an episode of Peep Show, I think, where Mark tries to become a tour guide. But that's set in Crouch End, where I am as well. Yeah, I'm not like Mark from Peep Show. But it was one of those things where I think I've always been a, a storyteller. And I think that I went into a career, into various careers, where you could use some of those skills, but you're inhibited by what you're doing. And I had a background in film. I was making videos and I was in that kind of business. But, you know, the real sort of the personal side, the face-to-face -face, was sort of frustrated. I had a business that I'd been working incredibly hard with, uh, had had some success with, but then I found myself pretty much working for free for myself, which meant that I spent a huge amount of time 
at home getting stressed and getting tremendously fat. At that point, I thought, what you need to do is you need to start walking. So I was out walking, and I thought, well, I can do certain, do one thing quite well, and that's talk. And then uh, this business in London emerged that was called uh, With Opens. And I'd had this idea where I thought, you know, I've, I've got to get some exercise. I love talking about history, and I'm passionate about sharing stories. So I signed up with them. I was one of the first guides that they had in London. I was asked to design one of their tours and I started getting really good reviews on it. And then I found that as a platform, what I could do with that particular platform was I could create bespoke tours. So for your basic tours, you're, you're kind of, you're making a bit of pocket money, which is, you know, helpful. And at that point, actually, was, I was getting enough bookings in that it was beginning to sort of turn the corner for me. And then I found with the bespoke tours, actually, I could make it much bigger tickets. I could realize I could charge more depending upon what I was creating for my guests and what they were asking for so after about three months of doing that and I had really good reviews which was a great ego boost as well it was you know a great way to sort of bolster one's confidence I um woke up in the middle of the night about 4 a.m the morning and I thought what am I going to call this thing if I do it under my own brand and I thought uh, the London storyteller came to me and from that moment it kind of clicked. It was lots of years of doing, running different businesses, working in different environments, involving things like branding and video and storytelling and the media and entertainment and such like. And it suddenly came together and clicked. So things like, um, you know, my site I built from scratch. I do all the, the visual assets like a lot of people will be doing if they're self-starters. But I'd learned those skills over a period of of years, even from when I was in bands and you've got to create your own kind of your image. Uh, and I was able to take all of those lessons and apply it. And it's funny, actually, even with the tools, there were things that I'd learned when I started out 10, 15 years ago, where I was really terrible and I had to learn to watch my audience. So once you've been really terrible at something, then you realize that you've got nothing to fear. You just need to keep on allowing yourself to get better. But that ability to sort of read your audience, which you learn from going up on a stage where you've got not much else apart from your wits about you, enables you to, I suppose, be able to hone something. So for me, it was the London Storyteller was a, a sort of a natural evolution out of all these things that I've done, all this hard work that I've put in. But I've never quite felt that it clicked. And this time it has. And it's taken me to places that I never expected to go. And I'm sure it will do again, many more in the future. Well, I'm a pre-COVID regular visitor to London, love the place. And when I look at your website and I look at your tours, you hit a few notes for me personally. Well, actually, that there's four in particular. So I'm a huge history buff. You have Churchill's London, discover the story of Sir Winston Churchill's life in London. I would be up for that. You have breakfast with a London storyteller. And here you are with the English breakfast that, of course, I have to make my own here in Vermont. So that appeals. You have the Swinging 60s London tour. And I think my favorite, because regular listeners know, I also host another podcast called Spy Brewery, where we talk about spy books and movies and histories. And you have a 007 London tour. How on earth did you go about curating and designing all these, these different tours? Well, I think partly because the discipline that initially you had with, with locals when, you, when I was starting off, and, and which I, I moved into my own model, and I still do things with, with locals who are a great business, was that it was bespoke. And the way I saw it was, if the brief comes in, what you do is you do your research. I found myself sometimes actually creating tours and learning about things that I didn't really know much about before, but I got it done. In the case of things like Churchill, Bond, 60s rock and roll and all these things. These are things that I've immersed myself in my life. And when I was doing these initial bespoke tours, I said, hey, you know, I'm charging a bit more, but I'm being paid to learn. And that is a wonderful thing. When you sit down to do things like a tour about church, I had to book in time for myself over a week or two, which for me is like a sort of a pre production process, like I would have in a, making a video where you, you know, you're, sit, you're sitting down, you're, you're studying, you're learning, you're immersing yourself in the subject. 
that's listening to a lot of audio books it's reading books it's you know spending a lot of time researching online it's watching videos and i have a pretty good baseline of knowledge with some of these things but there's an awful lot of research that you do that's a lot of work to invest in doing it but at the same time it's not work is it it's play yeah so these are four different kind of themes i pointed out here you've got more so those four themes, were they something that you just had a personal interest in and thought, I'm going to build a tour around it? Or was this feedback or were you doing some kind of research on the tours you were giving where people's ears pricked up when you mentioned Churchill or 007 or Swing 60s? How did you realize that there would be a demand for the different tours? Yeah, to a certain degree, it is listening to the guests that you have and you get that benefit through the day-to-day experience of, of doing things. Uh, the other angle is sitting down and looking at it and thinking right what does london have that we can do tours on or we can create a sort of an experience around which are kind of ready to go and i suppose the other thing to that is also what are the things that are, i'm going to want to sit down for two to three weeks and really invest myself and to a degree what's my base life level of, of knowledge what do you think is going to be fun i mean i think this relates to reading your audience when you know, when you've had previous guests i know everybody knows james bond most people don't realize that the best james bond is roger moore if i ask my guests who is the best bond and i get some mad people say Piers brosnan but it's very <laughs> clearly roger moore and i say roger moore they say well how come you're allowed to say it's roger moore and i say because i'm the tour guide but i think also what you find is with these subjects is that they have many other sort of tangential references. So you could be talking about James Bond, but equally, you know, you could be making reference to Aston Martin cars or or Lotuses or, or whatever. So in the case of Churchill, for example, you know, there's, I mean, his daughter, for example, is one of the co-founders of Glastonbury. His mother was the lover of Edward VII, who had a uh, an elevator. She had an elevator put in her apartment block because he'd become rather portly and was struggling with the stairs. So he could uh, go into the ground floor and come straight up to uh, her boudoir. But these things are, you know, so there you've got immediately stories which you can pull out, which you make relevant. To them. And the thing with the tours is I don't think that it's about going out with a set script. I think that what you do is you have your, your knowledge base and then you kind of find out through building up rapport with your guests you may know a bit about this before you do it, but you find out what interests them. And so not everybody in a group, because I'd only do privately guided talks. So, you know, sometimes you've got a family or you've got a group and you've maybe got two out of six who, you know, they're not interested. They're interested in grime music, not Winston Churchill, but they've been dragged along. Uh, and at some, and I, I might struggle to make a leap from Churchill to grime, but, you know, if, if there's a way that I can find something that they are interested in or find an angle or from experience then i'll try and leap that make leap that boundary to in, involve people because people will only go so far listening to somebody talk about something that just interests them people like when you have passion and you have enthusiasm about your subject but it's really critical that you have i suppose the ability to pull a few rabbits out of the hat and it will get people even the most you know, miserable <laughs> in a good mood, which you very rarely have with guests because they're here in London to have a good time. Absolutely. And it's something I hear from every guest on this show, and it's my own travel experience as well, is that the tours we we really remember are those that give us that insider experience. So if you think about Churchill, you are pointing out buildings where he lived, worked, ate, drank, but they might be buildings that most would just would just walk by and not especially in London, so many historic buildings that are something else today and you have no idea. And, and I went on a uh, private spy tour many years ago in London and same thing. Like I've got all the books next door on Philby and Blake and McLean. And every, but when they show you, oh, that's where George Blake was interrogated. That's where they brought him in when they realized he was a wrong. And, you know, it's bringing it alive. You're getting the insider experience. That you just can't get from a book or a YouTube channel. Absolutely. And one of the great advantages of being in, in somewhere like London is, there are stories on the corners of every street. My Breakfast with the London Storyteller Tour is in a very convenient location for me because it's in my neighbourhood. It's in Crouch End. And I do also an authentic local tour 
But I could walk you past a very nondescript barbershop and I could point out to a, um, an unsuspecting guest that that's where Winston Churchill had one of the saddest moments of his life when he went to his nanny's bedside at the age of 21 and she was dying there in the, uh, in the upstairs room of her sister, Mary Ann Evers. If you look from it outside, you know, it's got a Lebanese takeaway out uh, next door to it. It's got this you know, uppercuts, I think they're called, uh, is the barbers. Nobody knows, there's no plaque there, but that was one of the very saddest moments of his life. And if I took you over the hill, I could show you where um, Adele recorded 24. And if I took you up the road, I could show you where the kinks of their studio. And if I took you 200 yards from there, I could show you where Colin Chapman founded Lotus Cars, which is another Bond reference. And this is just one little neighborhood and we're not that we're not that remarkable but when you've studied the streets i mean i found out that churchill fact not through learning about crouch end i found that about learning about churchill and that's where you find these surprising little facts that come up but it's amazing all those things you can pull in together within a few square miles and we're not even in the center of the city did you know every weekday Shane curates the most interesting news articles in tours and activities and sends them out in a snappy daily digest? Grab your copy of the Torpreneur Daily Briefing at www.torpreneur.com. So I asked you previously come on the show about your three topics on learnings, on, on how you grew your business. What would be your three top tips you would share with other tourpreneurs around the world? The first one you gave to me was trusting in your creative instinct and building a vision organically. How do you mean exactly? By trusting in my instinct, I kind of like where my nose takes me with it tends to get me in the right places. You know, I'll give you an example. So I started doing these tours because I needed to get some exercise and I kind of needed a few quid. Um, so I followed my nose. I trusted my instinct and I thought, look, just do this. That worked well. Within a couple of years, by trusting in that instinct, I found myself in Gothenburg developing an augmented reality app, which means that you have a virtual version of me in your pocket. Now, how did I go from this place to that place? Well, you couldn't plan it, but it kind of happens because it enables you to go full steam ahead. I think it enables by trusting in your creative instinct you're able to see the bigger picture that you just invested in what you're doing. I hope that isn't a really flowery answer. Yeah, it resonates because this is not like running a restaurant, right? You, there is formula to running many restaurants. When you're running a tour, it's individual, especially for yourself. You don't have, you know, 100 tour guides out there and part of a franchise. This is your tour. So you do have to trust your creative instinct when you want to try new things and, and you feel an urge to do something a little bit different. It's not like, you know, the McDonald's model of business, what we're doing here. It's not cookie cutter, I guess. And the same as building organically, you know, you're learning with every tour. Oh, that gag went down really well. Or I wish we'd had more time for the barbershop with Churchill because they, they really liked that. I was surprised how much they, you know, and you're building as you're going along rather than, no, no, this is what I want to do. And that's what matters. You're always constantly evolving and, and designing your tours, I think. Absolutely. I mean, you're always trying new things. And that's particularly with the bespoke route, depending upon where you're, you're based. But I think most people will find that this is translatable. You've got this fantastic blank canvas. Yeah, sure. You know, you've got to learn how to mix the paints, shall we say, right? All the different bits of information. And there's going to be a period of time while you're doing it. But the reward is that you're going to get all these people from all over the world that have come for one thing when they're with you, the vast majority of them, and that's to have a good time. And that's to meet somebody who's going to talk passionately and with enthusiasm about the things that make this city tick and share with them things that they didn't know. There's a natural energy with that, isn't there? There is. There is. And we're talking about trusting creative instinct as if it's easy. And it's not. It's very difficult for us to go, okay, this is me on my own running this business. I don't have a handbook. I don't have a standard operating procedure here. I've got to do this myself. And many of us, I think, suffer from imposter syndrome. So it's great to hear you talking about how your tours have evolved and how you've kept designing them and developing them. Because we're talking about it. Like I say, it sounds easy. It's not, in my opinion. I, I think you're right. You know, this thing about imposter syndrome, is that something that I felt in my previous careers on a number of on a number of occasions? And I felt like a rabbit scared in the headlights. But this I didn't, partly because 
I suppose that I kind of knew that I'd had some experience and some other things in, in coming into it. But also, I think that you can see from your reviews, and it's very rarely that you do a job where you're going to get reviews, you're going to get feedback. I mean, like, you know, I think the only bad review that I've had, and they're virtually all on with locals, I think like the only, the only bad review I've ever had was from somebody that didn't even turn up for the talk. I always ask my guests at the end of a tour, you know, I hope you enjoyed it. And, and I do listen to them. And also I can read them. I mean, like, I can kind of tell if they're not having a good time. And I'll ask, that may well not be, you know, it probably isn't down to me or you as a guide, as a host, because there could be any number of things that are going on. But it is this great thing that I think that one of the shields against imposter syndrome with this, which is a really interesting thing, is, is that, yeah, you're getting this feedback constantly. But also, you know what? If you do do a tour, uh, you have some guests where you think, you know, I was stumbling around with that. I couldn't quite remember things or I had to go and check notes. I don't use notes now. I have a tablet I show pictures from. But I, my first few tours were, were with some notes, like I think like a lot of people do. But, you know, what I learned from that was that basically if I had those awkward moments, I just went back and and brushed up on it you know because the thing is is that unlike a lot of businesses where your guests are going to be you know you have a client and that client you have a relationship with over years and years and years with guests on tours it's kind of every time you do it you've got a fresh blank sheet of paper and the thing that you can take with you are the learnings from what you've uh, where you've you've stumbled or where you know you think you could have done a better job and the confidence that comes from lovely guests. And I think most people actually booking private tours, they kind of, they want to meet the people that are doing their, their, that's why they've gone for a private tour experience. That's the lovely thing about the private tour model is that you are actually able to really focus upon a particular group. Whereas if you've got like 30 people as, you know, for people that have just, they signed up for like a tenner ago or something like that. You know, that's a hard gig because it's very hard to, you know, relate to people as individuals. And a lot of it really, it's not just about things you tell people, but it's the things you ask them to find out and make it conversation. Absolutely agree. Your second major tip was play to your strengths. Small can also mean you are nimble and ambitious, especially when there is a digital disruption afoot in your sector identify and make new trends work for you. So let's uh, deconstruct that one. So when you're talking about digital disruption, how has that affected you? Well, firstly, it created the opportunity because with locals were part of that digital disruption. And in past lives, I've been part of digital disruption as well. In this particular case, what I was able to see was that there's a, a marketplace to create bespoke, personalized private experiences. And that those could be sold in terms of reputation and brand. And obviously underneath that sizzle is the stake. And that is you, you know, and, and that's how we, that's about building reviews. So the way I saw it was with the London Storyteller was that basically I don't need to compete with Expedia. I can see that there are lots of other tour operators in London. And it's a bit different at the moment with the pandemic. But I can create something which is true to me, which is authentic, which is an extension of myself, which is what the London storyteller is, warts and all, you know, for good and for bad. But because I'm nimble, because I'm small as a business, it doesn't mean I can't think big. And it doesn't mean I can't do innovative things. So, for example, Breakfast with the London Storyteller, you know, there's a guy that runs the McLaren Formula One team. They're always banging on about he has his breakfast meetings, Zach Brown. Uh, and, uh, and I thought, I wonder if I could do a Zach Brown. I wonder if I'd get the point, you know, it's, life has got to be going pretty well. If somebody's going to pay you £100, Tom, to have breakfast and talk about things you're interested in. So we did it. In the same time, there are other projects which have come along where I began to sort of look at how, even though, you know, it's a small business, but how can you think big? Well, you could charter speedboats and play handles water music and then Jimi hendrix when you go through tower bridge and you're at, you're in a, a speed unrestricted zone and doing 32 knots now that's a different kind of model isn't it? it's not just doing 
tools, but it's creating an experience which is bespoke to particular guests. I realized that I think about six or seven months into this, I, I had a, a group of guests from California. They were three families all together, lovely people. And I had an inquiry through a private travel agent in America. And it was the first time I was taking four figures a day. And what I had to create for them was a program over the course of a week, which had many different elements, things I hadn't done before. But, you know, I found a coach firm, a small coach firm, and we privately chartered a coach. I took them to Oxford. I took them to Stonehenge. I took them to places that I knew that maybe other people would. We had a 4th of July party in Benjamin Franklin's house, and we had lunch at the Mayflower Pub and things like this. This is a military operation, you know, but I thought, well, there's no reason why I can't do it. You can make a successful business. You don't need to be as big as Expedia. You don't need to be a business which is trying to get, you know, be a million pounds a year necessarily, uh, or 10 million. You can make a, a good living and, and, and off the back of it. So the question comes to my mind is, is you compare that with Expedia, but of course Expedia have lots and lots of money for marketing. How did you win that piece of business rather than book through Expedia? Well, I think that's partly done on reputation and on word of mouth. But I would say that on this thing about how do you go toe to toe with Expedia and things like this, I was an early adopter of a platform called Boken, which I didn't get amazing results from, but I learned a lot and I thought their development curve was going to be a lot better. I'm currently with a platform called Trexoft, but originally I just used WooCommerce and I think the plugin called Booked was in my website. But the one I saw actually with this David and Goliath thing of somebody like Expedia and, and an independent was there's no point in spending money really on uh, Google AdWords because you're never going to be, and there are lots of other providers out there, you're not going to be. So the trick is to go and get, use a platform like Boken. Like I said, I didn't get the kind of results that I was hoping to. That's partly because we got scuppered with a global pandemic and and it's new technology. But they have mar- they have a marketplace, as do people like Treksoft. So basically, if you can create your tours on a platform, I would recommend the central platform you use. These guys will enable you then to connect with other sales channels and marketplaces. And then effectively, you're, you're being sold through affiliates. They take a bit of quite a bit of commission. And that's where you have to start thinking, you know, how your margins are going to work particularly if you're including certain expenses and then they're taking 25% of your expenses, which is madness. But those platforms enable you then to go and increase the reach of what you're doing. You know, it's really hard, I think, to go and and compete, not just in search, but organic search, I think is really important. This is where you're not really paying to promote, but your website is a good environment. It has lots of relevant information about what you're doing. Mine could certainly be a lot better on that front. But, you know, I look at things like social social platforms now, and, you know, they're so saturated with advertising. It's very hard to cut through organically, really hard. I personally look, look at those platforms now. I do use Instagram and it links to my Facebook but, you know, other than that, I'm not really on them because I got and I used to be, run a business which specialized in social media marketing through live streaming. And I've really looked at those, some of those platforms now, particularly Facebook and Twitter. And I don't think it's somewhere where I want to be spending money. And um, there's so much saturation. And in some ways, I don't think people are quite so keen on them anymore. It's a mixed bag. We have some of our listeners that are crushing it on Facebook ads and then others that are burning through cash. And that's then the argument about, yeah, 25% to the OTA. But if they're bringing you business, you could be spending that amount, setting up Google AdWords, pulling your hair out, because it's not (laughs) an easy thing to do. So we're seeing a mixed bag with some people who are having quite a lot of success with, with Facebook ads. But, you know, with these new technologies, so TikTok, I mean, I'm a big football fan. I watched most of the Euros, and TikTok were spending millions of dollars on sponsoring that. And even I started to think, well, maybe I need to take this TikTok seriously then. If they're having their brand all over every football match, is that something that's going to come into play? But the question always is bandwidth. How much time do we have? And also going back to your first point about being creative, maybe you're not good on video, right? Or 
good with images or you're not a great photographer. It's knowing where your skills are and where you can be authentic. Don't try and be something, one of these influencers or celebrities, if you're not comfortable with it. Yeah, absolutely. Going back to your original question about why did that travel agent find me? I looked at my website really as being a shop front, not necessarily to sell tours. I do sell tours through it, but I looked at it as a shop front where what the London storyteller is, what the London storyteller could be is presented, you know, as honestly as, as I can. And it just meant that when they found it, you know, like a good travel agent, if they've had a good word of mouth recommendation, they go on your website and it looks like a nice website and also kind of you, you know, what you're presenting feels good to them. People look for different things. I'm sure that, you know, if you were looking for a football tour in London, you wouldn't book somebody like me. I don't know much about football. I'm Spurs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. But this is what I want to say, though, is so we didn't know each other prior to connecting through Tourpreneur. I looked at your website and, you know, I look at hundreds of tour operator websites every week. And I, I immediately went to your description of your 007 London tour. That's something, as I said, I don't have a big interest in. And I could immediately see one of the one of the biggest reasons why I'm like, oh, I want to book a tour with this guy is you have in big letters keeping the British end up, which I'm sorry to get nerdy and geeky. If you're a Roger Moore, James Bond fan, you know what movie that's from. I know you know your stuff. You could have just written, don't be shaken, be stirred or something really kind of cheesy. But the fact you had that in your logo and then I go through, you label them as chapters, the different parts of the tour, the themes. I can see you cover Fleming the various buildings. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get something out of this because this guy clearly knows his stuff about 007. So I think there's a lot of authenticity in your tour descriptions, which you know, sadly is lacking on many tour operator websites. Well, thank you very much. This thing about the chapters, that was something which I thought it just seemed really logical when I did it. And I like the idea. I mean, things like the Churchill tour, I, originally when I came up with that, I kind of saw it as a walking biography. And the plan was to do quite a few walk-in biographies. But uh, I found that the Churchill one did require quite a lot of research. <laughs> you can read 10 different tours on that. I mean, that's really joyful when you get somebody who's a real you know, geek about something as well. It's also great fun as well being able to relate these things to people that don't know about the subject. And they, so they take something away from that too. That's a really nice experience. I mean, top fact, people often don't know this about. Bond, well, I love revealing this, is that um, Ian Fleming wrote Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And uh, that's something which people are thought, oh, really? Yeah, most people don't know that. I agree. Roald Dahl wrote the script for Chitty Chitty Bang Bang as a film. But then when you think about it, oh, my God, you know, that's more English than William and Kate or um, Bacon and Eggs. It's such an English sort of thing. And if you're visiting London and you're not from the UK, those sorts of things, I think, are quite nice. You know, they sort of they resonate. But let me challenge you there. So I am reading a lot right now of operators that are marketing to locals because obviously most of us are not traveling. We're not traveling far afield. And I know for a fact, when I was living in London many moons ago, if I saw your 007 tour, I'd be coming on it. And I know there are lots of 007 fans who are in the UK. So maybe that is something... We can discuss it off air if you like, but maybe that's also another area of marketing for you. Say, okay, I know there are James Bond fans in the UK. I know there's plenty around London and the home counties. Why aren't they coming on my tour? Yeah, that's a very astute observation. Actually, I did think, I mean, I've written down notes various times during the pandemic where it's like, you know, because most 70, 70% of my business was from America and, and sort of the next 25% or so was from the EU or, 20% from the EU, maybe 10% Australian. So, you know, I thought, right, during this pandemic, what can save the day? And I thought, it's got to be Bond, Churchill, and the Royals. Those three topics. The other one, actually, is probably Samuel Pepys that, I, that I've been developing a new tour for, which everybody who's gone to school in, in Britain knows about Samuel Pepys and the Great Plague. And I spent a lot of time during the first lockdown reading his diaries for my YouTube channel because it was the only way to keep yourself sane while you're in lockdown and not able to be out being the London storyteller. But why haven't I marketed more to domestic markets? Well, I think it's partly because we've been solidly locked down. So I've been really quite 
careful with that. I mean, like we, you know, just most of this year has been blown out of the water, really. I've only had a few tours since the, um, the restrictions began to lift in. And I suppose that we'll have to see. I mean, I think that will probably will be part of the backbone. You know, depending on when people are listening to this, hopefully there are green lights between US and UK. As we're recording this, President Biden has met with Merkel in Germany and Biden's turned around and said, I'm looking at it. I want to get transatlantic open. So who knows? By the time this is aired, Americans can travel to UK and vice versa again. Let, let's hope because, you know, I'm jonesing to get home for a, for a trip myself and to get to Europe. It's been almost two years. So uh, maybe we won't have to worry about marketing locally. Maybe we'll be, we'll be back to normal with people coming in. I know people can't wait to travel. I really hope so. I really hope so, Shane. I'm, I think that also, to a certain degree as well, this kind of evolving your business takes time. And one of the things which the last couple of years has given me is I suppose the well, last year and a half with the pandemic now sadly has given me a chance to sort of evolve what I'm doing and evolve what my, my kind of my presence is so I think in the future the way in which I position my business is going to be or the London storyteller is going to maybe be slightly different in that respect you know I think in this country also though there is a bit of a weird wall between London and the rest of the country and that's something that we've seen in the city over the last, certainly over the last 12 or 18 months. London's expensive if you're in other parts of the UK. It is. I found a video on my iMovie the other day from July last year or June last year. And there's a video clip that I did the day before outside Buckingham Palace. And there was nobody there. And then the next day, driving into Wells next to sea in Norfolk, I videoed the quayside there and, you know, it was packed by Woodstock. It was like a festival, you know, and that's something that really in, in the UK, particularly London, you know, people have they've gone to the seaside. I want to get on to your, your third tip before we wrap up here, but I, I agree with you on that. And I was getting frustrated when I kept reading online from certain industry commentators, travel is back, travel is back. And on our Facebook group, I put a poll up, is travel back? And it was such a mixed bag. There were some people that were going, oh, we're crushing records here in the U.S. Virgin Islands or in Nebraska. And then there were people in cities like New York City and D.C. that were like, yeah, I'm not, the phone isn't ringing. I'm not taking any bookings. So there, it, it is very dependent on destination in terms of where travel is back. I want to get on to your third tip. So you said the importance of fulfilling your brief to your audience to give them an exceptional experience. I treat my guests the same way I used to read an audience when performing as a musician and the same techniques I used when I was a sales professional in a former life. They are one in the same. Could you share a couple of your uh, secret tips and tricks about how you are reading an audience based on your experience as a musician, a sales pro? I suppose the right kind of questions about how people feel or if you know that there are particular lines of inquiry and in stories that you want to share whether or not that might be something of interest to in them. I mean, for example, with James Bond, who is your favourite Bond? Is it Roger Moore? Is it Sean Connery? Or whatever. Well, you know, if somebody says, I absolutely, and it never happens, but I think he was one of those, they say, I absolutely love Timothy Dalton. Then I know that I'm going to be talking with them shortly about the Aston Martin Vantage V8, which is the best Aston Martin, and the one that he uses in The Living Daylights. I'll probably mention how the the car radio and it was the same that my father had in his Vauxhall Cavalier. And uh, that is a sort of a reference to somebody who's... So that's one thing. I'll try and pick up, uh, for example, with my, I call it swinging 60s, but actually it's art and music because this was kind of what I studied at university. It, obviously, you've got obvious questions there where you're, you know, you're going to... You want to kind of measure, like, how much knowledge somebody has about something. So who are their favourite bands from that era? And... You know, if they mention the Kinks, for example, then I know that I'm going to be talking with them about the number of times that I've seen Ray Davies wandering around Highgate, the Highgate Pond, or that he drinks in the Prince of Wales, and, and you can never talk to him because he'll just uh, get a glance away. But if I'm really lucky, they'll talk about the Who and Home Drive. So finding out, I suppose, from your guests by just sort of probing questions. You can also find out then if they literally say uh, well, I'm not really interested in music at all. You may well think, okay, you're kind of on the wrong top. And I suppose that then you've got to decide 
how you're going to balance out, bring in the knowledge you do have to relate to them. Because it maybe they, they're not interested in the music, but maybe you can some personalities associated with it. Because well, maybe if they're not able to um, name a Jimi Hendrix song, you know, they might be interested in the story of, of him and Handel living in the same house. And who's Handel? I mean, like they may not know who Handel is. So tell them how, who Handel is, you know, because there are these amazing stories about these people, which often they don't know. So it's not just on the basis of the fact that that they're knowledgeable about a subject or even sometimes particularly interested in about a subject. It's finding the stories and trusting in your instinct so that you can surprise people, you can entertain them takes a little bit of courage and it doesn't always go right but I, I found that you know typically you can surprise people if you know your subject and you find interesting angles on things talking of knowing your subject sprechen sie deutsch ja ein bisschen aber ich habe deutsch auf schule vor drei jahre gelernt and Fra- no drei jahre und französisch vor fünf jahre gelernt so the, the reason I, i'm uh, talking in german here is as i want tom to share his story Tom, you you were going to take a group of Germans out in London, and you talking of listening, you made an assumption which we would all make, which was that they could all speak English, but that wasn't the case, was it? No, and I found out about five days. It was at the point early on when I was like, I am taking on any tour, and I'm going to deliver it, whatever, even if I've got to do lots of extra work. And about five days before the tour, the guest contacted me and said something. Oh, you know, it isn't German, isn't it? No, and it had just been a mistake. It's not wasn't on my side. It was just that it had fallen into my lap, and and so I said, "Well, I'm very happy to do the tour, but I haven't really spoken German since I was in secondary school. I think I got a B <laughs> in GCSE history." And I said, "Yeah, that's okay." So it's a group of about nine Germans that were actually part, sort of part of like an adult learning course. So anyway, I I, I thought, right, this is going to be a mountain to climb but I'm, I'm willing to take it on and uh, I quite like the challenge so I went and wrote down kind of a script for what I would you know cover for the locations that I thought would interest them then I used Google Translate but then I went to Odesk Odesk to check it and I found a translator there who for the incredible sum of $20 went off and properly translated it for me and I explained to them the, the use, but I, I know Odesk, I've used it loads. And if you're ever looking for a freelancer to do bits and pieces for whatever you're doing with your business, Odesk is a great platform, a bit like Fiverr. So anyway, did that. I then spent about four days driving my girlfriend absolutely mad because she doesn't speak any German as I waltzed around the house trying to speak in German. And my, I've only really spoken German about Michael Schumacher and Bitburger beer in the last 20 years. So what, what happened when they turned up and you're, and you're there with your translation and how did it go? It was great. They were really happy. I mean, they, they had said it was okay to do with the script. They were generous in spirit. And I just about pulled it together enough. You know, I learned a bit more about how to speak German. <laughs> but they were fine. They were happy with it. I even received one of those... Um, rarest of things and uh which was a a tip from a german guest and that's no criticism of, of the germans because they're, they're always very generous with hindsight would you do that again or would you turn the business down and just say yeah that that's too stressful do you know it depends which language it was in if it was in french i spent a lot of time trying to pick up some french again during the lockdown and i really wanted to do a tour in french i probably would now i think i probably would pass it on because I don't know. It it was a lot of stress. Yeah, I think that maybe now I know I can. I need to value my time, and that was something where I put in a lot more time and a lot more effort than I would, I should do normally with tours. And that's one. Actually, that's one lesson that I will pass on to anyone who's listening. Most important thing to do is to value your time, and I mean that in terms of you know when you're preparing, make sure that you go and get the benefit of that in the longer term, that you're not just letting tours drag on for hours and hours outside of the hours that you're doing, because I know that there are guests out there that will really appreciate that. And that's very pleasant. But, you know, it's you have to put a value on your time. 
but that tour with my German guests you did, they were fantastic. They yeah. were really great people, as are like 99% of the guests that I have. And I guess that actually, when I talk about valuing your time, I don't want to be too mercenary about it, because I know that part of the joy of doing what we're doing, part of the great fortune is it is fun. It's great to spend time with other people. It's great to meet other people and to be able to share what you're passionate about. But as a business, you do have to get to the point where you think, if I put a lot of research into something, I should be charging top dollar because I'm worth it. And that's universally true for anybody that's that's doing tours. If you've put the work in to get it down to a tea, you really should you know, make sure you value your time as best you can. Well, talking of time, we're out of it, which is a shame because I could speak to you and chat with you for hours. But I, I promise you when uh, we're allowed to fly to London, I'm coming home and I will be booking a tour with you. It'll either be the 007 tour or the Churchill tour. But I also, for our other podcast, Spybury, will be hosting a meetup in London at some point. So we'll have to have a chat about maybe uh, having us all come on your tour. I think that would be a great thing to do. That would be lovely. And thank you so much for your time. And I have really enjoyed it. And I've been enjoying Talkpreneur for quite some time. Thank you. And you can find all of Tom's tours at the LondonStoryTeller.com show notes will be at tourpreneur.com forward slash 156. If you enjoyed it, well, sorry, if you enjoyed, I know you enjoyed today's episode. Do share it with your friends and peers in the tour and activity industry. That's Tourpreneur. Cheerio. Thanks for listening to the Tourpreneur podcast. Be sure to visit tourpreneur.com to join the conversation and access the show notes, including links to the resources mentioned on today's episode. This is Tourpreneur.